The lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of Mark, the 10th chapter. And this is a continuation of a series of lessons that we have been reading over the course of the last few weeks. You're going to see a continuing theme developing over this week and the next coming weeks. Some of the Pharisees came to Jesus to test him, and they asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed that a man write a certificate of dismissal and divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the be beginning of creation, God made them both male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And so once again, when their disciples were in the house with Jesus alone, uh, they began to confront Jesus about this matter. But Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against him. Now that's the first part of the lesson. We're not going to look at this in our sermon for today. But I do want to point out something that's really intriguing about this. You notice that Jesus adds something that the Pharisees, in their question, do not add. That's about the woman divorcing the man. Because how often do you think a woman would divorce a man in that day and age? I don't think it happened too often. But I do think what Jesus is trying to do is really talk about the injustices that were done to women in that day and that culture by divorce. Because often a woman who was divorced was not able to marry again. was put in a position where she had very limited options about providing for her future. And so it's truly an injustice the way that men treated women in that day. One of the things I love about Jesus is he always lifts women up. He doesn't tear men down. He lifts women up. See, oftentimes in our culture, we got to tear people down in order to bring them to our level. Jesus never does that. He always takes us where we're at, but he lifts everybody else up so that we're all in the same plane. And so that's one of the things that I think we learned in that lesson about divorce for today. But we're not going to look at that portion of it. We're going to look at the next portion today, which is from Mark chapter uh, 10, verse 13. So people were bringing little children to Jesus that he might bless them and touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to him, to them. But when Jesus saw this taking place, he was indignant. And he said to them, let these little children come to me, but do not stop them. For to such as these, the kingdom of heaven belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child who will, and will never, who does not enter the kingdom, uh, receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter into it. And so then he took them into his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Bless our time together, God, as we reflect on what it means for the children to come to Jesus, and what it means for us to need to come to Jesus as children. So we ask you to bless our time together, and open up our hearts to your word and will, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I do invite you to pull out your handout for today. If anybody's watching online or watching after the service, we do include these on our Facebook pages. You're welcome to download one for yourself. It is a sermon handout entitled, Jesus and Children. And so it is in the box that contains my summary of what our lesson is about today. And so when we look at this lesson, what I find really intriguing is that this is a lesson that follows up on several stern rebukes that Jesus has done with his disciples. They were truly blockheads, weren't they? It seems like Jesus has to teach them over and over and over the same thing again and again. In fact, we're going to see this very same lesson taught over the course of the next few weeks because Jesus never can seem to get through to these blockheads. And so here I am standing in, 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 as an indictment against the disciples, and then I have to stop myself and say one thing. Would I be any different than them? I don't think so. See, it's so easy to throw that phrase out. Oh, those disciples were such idiots. They were such blockheads. But you have to remember a couple of things. They did not have the advantage as we do of standing on this side of the resurrection, did they? There's a second thing. Even though they walked and talked directly with Jesus, this whole Jesus thing and what he was coming to do was brand new. And if you ever go home in your life I don't know if you've ever had this in your life, where you had the highest highs in your life, and it's like, oh man, look what Jesus did. And then you go out and you get a flat tire. It's like, dang it, where's God when I need him? Have you ever done that? Yeah. Yes. In fact, I've been so high one minute and so low the very next minute, and it's like, 
Oh, I can't believe this. Well, you're a blockhead too. Okay, you're just like the disciples. Because the disciples were no different than us, and we are no different than them. So I've been a lot kinder to the disciples, because I recognize they're just they're humans like you and me, with all the frailties and doubts and fears. And they had also been taught all their lives that the reason for the Messiah was to come was so that he might usher in a new political and military age. So can you, can you blame them for being blockheads about this and not getting it? And so we have four occasions right now, including today's lesson, where Jesus has confronted the disciples about their inability to understand that the kingdom that Jesus is going to usher in has nothing to do with worldly power, might, and military uh, prowess. And so the very first time, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 33, Jesus rebuked Peter for uh, trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross and dying. He said, this is what's going to happen. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. Well, somehow they forgot that. And then he had to confront them again. He rebuked his disciples in Mark chapter 9 for arguing about who would be in the positions of power in the kingdom of heaven. You see, there were 12 of them, and they were looking forward to see who was going to be the right hand, the left hand man. We're going to get that again because we're going to get a lesson where John and James' mom comes to Jesus and says, Hey, my boys are such good boys. You should have them as your right hand and left hand man. And Jesus says, Oy vey. He's Jewish. He can say that, right? Oy vey. You guys just don't get it. And then third time, last week's lesson, if you remember, the disciples were really skating on thin ice because what did they do? John, in particular, prevented a man who was healing in Jesus' name. He says, you can't heal in Jesus' name because you're not one of the twelve. And Jesus is like, man, you guys, you're skating on thin ice because you're no better than the scribes if you do something like that. When you try to prevent somebody from being of service to God and using their abilities to bless in the name of God. So blockheads, right? Just like you and me. Do you know the one thing I feel about this as I read these lessons and we get to this lesson where Jesus has to confront his disciples again about the same thing is, gosh, isn't Jesus patient, kind, and good? Because most of us would have been up to here in our tolerance level with these guys. We said, I've had enough. You know, have you ever had a situation where you've had to show somebody at work three or four or five or ten times the same thing over and over again. Or maybe it's your kid that you got to show ten times. There are times you're like, okay, I've just had enough. How many times do I have to show you this? Well, for Jesus, how many times do you have to show his disciples the same lesson over and over again? As many times as it takes. Because unlike us, Jesus is patient and kind and gracious. And I really respect that about Jesus as a, one of the many things, obviously. So once again, the exact same least lesson that Jesus has to teach. See, his disciples saw that all these people were bringing children up to Jesus. And they're like, oh, they're a waste of time. We're not going to worry about them. And Jesus has to confront his disciples for the fourth time about the same exact lesson. Because once again, remember, the disciples were believing that the, uh, Jesus was going to be ushering this new political, uh, be the new political and military leader that was going to usher in a brand new age. And the disciples were jockeying for positions in this kingdom. And they still did not get that Jesus' kingdom is not the same as the kingdoms of this world. So any of you who believe that the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus is trying to crash into this world, has something to do with the politics of this world, get rid of it out of your head. Because I'm telling you, you radical right-wingers and left-wingers believe the same thing, except you're opposite sides of the political spectrum. You believe that your Jesus is going to bring in a new political day which has to do with your politics, and that's a bunch of crap. Because your politics, right wing, left wing, don't care. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. I know you're good people. Good for you. Go out and bring about your politics if you want to, but do not use the name of Jesus to do it. Because Jesus has nothing to do with the politics of this world. Can I be more stern in my rebuke of this? Why do I say this? Because I see this all the time. My right-wing and left-wing brothers and sisters arguing about what type of politics would Jesus be? He'd be a Democrat. He'd be a Republican. He'd be a socialist. He'd be a communist. He wouldn't be any of those things because Jesus doesn't affiliate with any of your political parties and isms. Jesus is for everybody, 
and the kingdom of heaven transcends all of this. Thank God. Amen to that. Huh? We have to stop using power to impose upon other people the kingdom of heaven because that is not the way of Jesus. And so Jesus, to illustrate his point, grabs one of the children that Jesus, or that his disciples, Jesus' disciples were pushing away from, he takes one and puts it on his lap. Now you got to imagine, what are the disciples thinking at this point? They're like, oh my gosh, what are you doing, Jesus? That child can't add anything to what we're going to be doing in the kingdom of heaven. They don't bring anything of value. Now, why do I say this? Actually, we had people in our church who believed that about children and teenagers. 20 years ago, we had a guy who used to make our counts, you know, count the number of people in our attendance every Sunday and so forth. And I would always get the figures back, and, and uh, I said, boy, you're probably 10, 12 people short. And, you know, and I'm just like, why, why are we short every Sunday? And I finally confronted him about it. I said, he said, well, there's only like 50, 60 people or whatever he, he would say for the Sunday service. I said, no, there's like 70 people there that were on Sunday. Oh, no, there's only 50 people. So, you know, it would be this tussling back and forth. So I went and counted one Sunday, and there were like 70. I'm just guessing the number, maybe 70, 75 people or so on Sunday church that, that week. And uh, he said, there are only 55 people. I'm like, are you blind? And finally, I figured out what he was doing. He wasn't counting the children and the teenagers because they weren't real worshipers because they don't contribute to the offering on Sunday and they don't do any volunteer work in the church. That was his thought process. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, they are valuable worshipers. They're counted in the numbers of people who are present on Sunday. But see, that's basically what the disciples were doing. They're saying the children just don't count. They don't matter because they don't bring any offerings and they don't contribute anything to the might and the power of the kingdom to come. So and from their perspective, even widows, widowers, were probably worthless as well because they bring no power, no ability to fight, and no financial resources to contribute to the cause of Christ. That's what Jesus' disciples were thinking. Again, they were, in their mind, people who should be seen or heard until they're able to contribute something of value. So Jesus sees this type of craziness going on, and so as a valuable, tangible, visible lesson, he pulls it in, a child, puts it on his lap, and he says something that really confuses and baffles his disciples. This is the inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. What? You mean not us? We've been following you for a couple of years. And you're telling me it's a, this kid, what has this kid done, Jesus? Is he going out and sleeping out with you? Is he going out and finding food? Is he going out and struggling day by day? Is he going out and confronting the scribes and the Pharisees? Is this kid going out and going to be fighting for you, Jesus? This kid is a squirt. Jesus is like, this is the way you got to be if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Like this baby. What the heck? Jesus is saying that these children who don't contribute anything in your perspective are equally deserving of God's blessing as you, Peter, and James, and John, and Matthew, and all the rest of you. Because the representatives of the true inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven are like children. Now, what did Jesus mean? And how baffling must this have been to the disciples? Obviously, they remembered it. And so obviously at some point they did learn. See, yeah, they were blockheads like you and me. But they learned, didn't they? Jesus was patient. And so Jesus was showing them a visible illustration because he figured that might burn in their head a little bit better about what it means to be a per, uh, partner in the kingdom of heaven. And so they understood it. Obviously they got the lesson because we read it today in our gospel account. Mark remembered so why are children the true representatives of the inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven? And I have a bunch of bullet points on your sermon handout for today. We're going to go through these and explain these. Because I think this is why it's so important to be like a child if we are to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. The first reason, the first bullet point under B on that second page, is because children do not struggle for position and title. 
Now, I'm not talking about eight, nine-year-olds. I'm talking about three and four-year-olds. They don't care about anything, about who's, whose daddy makes the most money. They don't care about position. They don't care about titles. That comes later in life, and it comes later in life because they're watching us parents. And for us parents, who's the boss and who's the minion is really important to us. The kids just don't care. And all I can do is I'll show you by taking a three-year-old, a four-year-old, and taking them and introducing them to a janitor, and then introducing them to Donald Trump. Okay? Do you think that kid cares? No. Nope. Don't think the kid cares about position and title at all. Because they're going to equally love everybody, whoever they are. They don't struggle for position, prestige. Second bullet point. Uh, their children, the reason why they represent the kingdom of heaven is because they are not trying to put somebody else in their place. Isn't that what we do? We just had an issue with that in our household, somebody trying to put my daughter in her place. And I don't care how old my daughter is, I don't tolerate that too well. I got a little bit ticked off and ended up with the person unfriending me. Woohoo! I don't care, because nobody's going to mess with my daughter. She's going to be 50 years of age. I'm still going to go to bat for her. Because, hey, we're parents. That's what parents do, right? We defend our kids. But nobody's going to dismiss my daughter as nothing, okay? But in the kingdom of heaven, we don't do that, okay? You don't dismiss somebody as nothing in the kingdom of heaven. We do that all the time, don't we? Today, in this world... We do that in the name of God, we do that in the name of our politics, we do that in the name of everything. There's always battles taking place. We need to stop dismissing each other and trying to put people in their place because that has no business. The kingdom of heaven and children would never do that to each other. We can't either. Third bullet point. The reason why children are representatives of the true king, the kingdom of heaven is because they do not believe that they are in any way better than anyone else. Now, I love is about three and four year olds. So you put a three or three or four year old together, three or four year olds together. They don't care if that next that three or four year old they're together with, uh, their parents are making millions of dollars. They don't care, and, and they don't care if the other child is dirt poor. They don't care. They don't care if that other child in front of them is black or white. They don't care. Where do they learn these bigotries later in life from us? Okay, but a child represents that true uh, 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 acceptance of people, whoever they are, they don't care about status or any of those things. They just accept you as you are, and they don't think of themselves as any better. Your nose is the same as my nose. Your hands are the same as my hands. You are the same as me, and I love that about kids. Fourth thing, why children are representative of the kingdom of heaven. Because they do not claim to have any type of secret knowledge that they use as a means of controlling other people. Don't we do this all the time in many of our congregations? I always have to be very careful about this. You know, sometimes, and I want you to be educated here, and so sometimes I'll come and I'll say, well, this is what the Greek says, or this is what the Hebrew says, but I don't do that. And I hope I never come across as though I'm doing that to have power over you as though you're an adult or an idiot. Because I don't believe that for a minute. I do that because it's my gift. I'm good at it. I love that type of stuff. I want to educate you. But I don't have secret knowledge about the Bible. You can learn about the Bible without me. I just want to make it easier for you to help you crack into that and to get some meat and some knowledge about things. However, I believe that a, a, a man, as we've had in our congregation with the 8th grade education, has just as much an understanding, if not more, of what it means to have a relationship with God as I do. So I think it's really important that we understand that we should never use our position in our churches to use our church to control other people's <clears throat> access to God. As though we have some type of secret knowledge. <laughs> you know, some churches will say, we've got all the answers, you come and listen to us. Well, I hate to say, if you come and listen to me, you're going to realize I've got a lot more questions than i got answers. And I'm probably not going to satisfy you if you come here just for answers. Because I'm going to help you look and struggle and wrestle. But I'm not going to give you anything. Because I think ultimately that's between you and God. And hopefully God will reveal to you what God wants you to know. Okay? I don't have special knowledge. We should never use that knowledge to control people. Next bullet point. 
The reason why children are representatives of the kingdom of heaven because they accept without reservation the love of their parents. Okay? As we grow older, we start to doubt. And that's because our parents sometimes let us down. But when we're three and four years old, our parents can do no wrong. And they just trust us that we're going to take care of them. They, they trust that we love them. And they just are comfortable with that. And so they come up to us, they sit on our lap, and they say, Oh, Daddy, oh, this, oh, Mommy. And it's such a cool thing when you've got a three- and four-year-old. And they just they love you so much, and they trust that you are going to love them. Even when they make mistakes, it's just an awesome time in life. And so it's just a shame at some point we lose that trust because sometimes we do let each other down. We let our kids down. But God never lets us down. And I think that's the lesson we learned from this. We need to understand we can come to God like little children and call him. What, is, what, do we, what can we call God? We can call him Daddy. That's what the Bible says. We call him Abba, Father, Daddy. That's the type of intimacy we can have and the trust that we can have that God loves us. Next bullet point. The reason why children are representatives of the kingdom of heaven is because they embrace things that others cannot accept. Now, for those who found us online, I'm going to tell you a, a little secret if you haven't figured this out, because we have two access points for you to come online. One is through the name of our church. One is through a name that we use as kind of a fake or fictitious name, and that fictitious name is the Revolution Church. You might not get from the Revolution Church that we are actually affiliated with a particular denomination. Okay, we're coming out today. We are affiliated with the Lutheran Church, and so we have a... We do have some particularities about us that are important to us. One is, you notice, we do communion every Sunday. For some people, that might seem odd. But for those who've been members of this church, they realize they look forward to that. Because they know that sometimes I really blow it when I preach. And they'll say, oh, that was really a crummy sermon. But at least we got fed when we came to communion today because God showed us how much we're loved. What's amazing about communion is the response of children to communion. And I remember when I first came to this church, and I've been at this congregation for 25 years, it was still the practice in many of our Lutheran churches that children received communion for the very first time when they were, you probably did this, because you're the only traditional person here, when you were confirmed. confirmed. Okay, and you came from a Roman Catholic background. You guys probably communed a little bit earlier, though, right? Probably fifth grade. We, uh, um, we in our church, you know, a lot of the Lutheran churches around the early 90s were starting to move to fifth grade probably a little bit earlier than that. But then we had a girl uh, named Ashley, and she actually still comes to church. Uh, and she, she's uh, making her schedule so she can come every Tuesday night. So that's kind of cool, too. But Ashley was like a three- or four-year-old at the time. And I'll never forget, she would come to communion. People would get really ticked off about this. She would come up with her great aunt. And, um, and I would bring the communion, give, give the bread for communion to her aunt, and, her, and Ashley would then put her hand out, and her aunt would break the bread and give it to Ashley, three-year-old, okay? And Ashley would take it every Sunday. And so she would commune at three years of age. And people got really upset, and they said, Pastor Dave, you need to confront her. That's not what we're supposed to do. She's allowing that Ashley to commune, and that's just wrong, and blah, 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 and I just can't believe that. And I just said, Ashley probably understands what commune is about better than all of you. And I'll tell you where it really broke in our congregation. I had a two-year-old who came up to me. My daughter did this, too. You know, about two years of age, it seems like, they come up to the altar with their parents, and they stick their hand out, and they say, Why can't I have Jesus? I want Jesus. Or something simple like that. Jesus, give me Jesus. Those kids understand communion better than any of us adults do. And that was kind of the floodgates opening up. And I just said, Hey, I'm going to commune any kid who puts her hand out, that kid is getting communion wafer. They may not get the wine, that's another story, but they're definitely going to commune with us because that child understands that we receive Jesus in a way that we adults don't. See, I think we overthink things. And so children just embrace, embrace God in such a childlike, wonderful way, and we need to do the same. And then the last thing, I love about children, I think the reason why Jesus says that they are representatives of the true kingdom of heaven is because they have no concept of the costs and concerns of life. And even if they did, 
they would just trust that their parents or somebody else are going to pay it for them. Okay, listen to what I mean by this. A four-year-old has no concept of what that food costs that's in front of them. And if they did, they wouldn't worry about it because they know that's the job of their parents. At some point, we start feeling like we've got to earn it. I've got to earn this. But if you're a parent, you just give it to your kids, don't you? Because you love them. At some point, we need to accept the fact that God loves us even more than our parents and just accept the fact that God just loves us. Just accept it and trust that what God gives, God wants to give to us because he just loves us. And that's it. There is no other rhyme. There is no other reason. We don't have to earn it. We don't deserve it. In fact, you cannot earn or deserve it. So I'm going to finish with this story. There was a woman named Janice. Member of her church, she died about 10 years ago. She was probably 60 when she died. When she was a younger woman in her 30s, she was very active. She was well-to-do. She worked a really good job. Uh, she was a professional lady, educated woman. In fact, she had a master's degree. She was one of the only members of our church who had an education beyond high school. So it was, she was just a very bright lady. Somewhere along the line, she was in a massive accident that crippled her to the point where she, she was like this, and she could barely walk, and she could barely take care of herself. It was a terrible, you know, tragic circumstance. That was before I actually knew her. So when I met her, she had already been probably five, six years, seven, eight years or so, uh, crippled and, and, uh, and depending upon the mercies of other people for her sustenance in her life. And it was a tough thing for her. She hadn't saved anything because, again, she was probably 30 or 40 when this accident happened. She was thinking, i got plenty of time to make stuff for retirement. i got plenty of time to save. i got plenty of time to this. And all of that was ripped from her. Okay? So Janice... Um, as she was a member of our church at that time, came and asked for some help because she didn't have enough food to put on the table for a week. He said, I just need some help for a couple of days. And so I went and I appealed to the congregation and I said, hey, congregation, can we help this woman out? She's really in desperate need. And so I'll tell you, you would not believe how much food our congregation brought in I had at that point a Saturn view, if you remember what a Saturn view was, kind of a, mid -si a smaller size SUV, one of the pretend SUVs, you know, the pretend ones, but still big truck area if you put down the back seats and so forth. I filled that vehicle twice with food that this congregation collected for her, food and supplies and other types of things. And I took it out there for her, and I'll never forget her jaw dropping when we started bringing this thing. And I don't remember who volunteered. I'm hoping somebody tells me, oh, I was there with you with that, because I know I had somebody who's a member of our church that went with me to her place when we took this stuff in. Her jaw just dropped, and she's like, what are you doing? And I just kept bringing and bringing and bringing, and we got done with the first trip. And I said, we'll be back. I got another trip. She said, what? I came back with the second trip. I came back. She was in tears. She said, I can't accept all this. I said, what do you mean you can't accept all this? I can't pay it back. I said, you're not supposed to pay it back. Well, that's just not right. And finally, I grabbed Janice, and I shook her like this. Well, okay, it's more like this, because she's pretty short. And I shook her, and I said, excuse me, what do you mean you can't accept this that we're offering to you? I can't. I have to pay it back someday. And I said, that's bull crap. I probably used another word. I hate to say it. I was mad. Because I said, this congregation loves you and wants to provide for you, and you just need to accept it. But I can't. And so I looked at her and I said, I'm going to tell you what. This is a test for you. God is testing you right now. Because what are you going to do when you get to the kingdom of heaven and God's got something even greater to offer to you and that's, he's going to make you a, an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven? Are you going to say, but I can't pay it back. Wait, what am I going to do? No, you're going to have to sit there and say, oh, thank you. I receive it. You see, the gift of the kingdom of heaven is so much more than two cars load full of food. And if you can't accept two cars load of full, full of food because people just love you, how are you going to accept the gift of the kingdom of heaven? 
You've got to come to God like a child and accept that God loves you and just wants to bless you just because. So this is my encouragement today for those watching home, those here today. You see, we are get all caught up in this idea that we have to earn everything. I've got to earn it. I've got to earn it. You don't have to earn squat when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be like a little child and just accept that God loves you because you are just adorable. Come to him as a little child and he will bless you with wonderful things. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you come to us and bless us. You didn't come part of the way to meet us. You didn't come 90% of the way to meet us. You came 100% of the way. You came from heaven itself to kneel down and crash into our squalid existence to make your love known to us. The kingdom of heaven is for those who come as children who just dance and jump around and splash in the puddles and say, ah, me father loves me very much, just the way I am, and that's a grand thing. And so I'm going to accept the gifts that God has to give me because God just loves me. So I'm asking you to be like a child in your faith today. Just accept the fact that God could love you so much that he'd be willing to die for you. Just accept it. That's all God wants from you. And so God, we thank you for all these things. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit we pray. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.